morning, everyone. It's absolutely fantastic to see so many people here today, having given up their uh, mornings uh, to come to this really important event. I'm told that this is the busiest uh, that this room at uh, Swiss Waterfront Innovation Centre has been since its launch, which is really fantastic. And I think it kind of underlines that this is a really key subject area. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we start. Um, we are on Twitter at Tech East UK, hashtag for today tech skills. So uh, unlike the usual message, which is please uh, put your mobile phones away and turn them off, please switch them on, tweet, uh, join in the conversation because I think uh, for the university and for techies alike, um, it's really important this year that we make the absolute maximum opportunity to communicate about some of the great things that are going on. Um, Mohammed has just talked about a new technology uh, skills institute here at the University of Suffolk. I mean, that is a brand new uh, concept, something that could really make a huge difference for the community and uh, something that we would be very excited to see happen. Absolutely fantastic to have that exclusive here this morning. So, um, before I start, I just want to, um, and I'm going to pick up my notes here because the list is quite long, I just want to thank a few people, and this is important. Um, I'd like to thank the University of Suffolk and the Ipswich Waterfront Innovation Centre for hosting this event. Uh, they're providing this uh, facility to us uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a gift, um, and uh, it's wonderful to have this environment. I think it's a fantastic uh, facility. And I really do urge you all to have a look around, go and see the new maker space, see the co-working space next door, the uh, soft room at the back, which provides you know breakout facilities. This is a really great asset for Ipswich and Suffolk. Um, I need to thank our founding funders, <coughs> without whom we wouldn't be here today, and without whom we wouldn't have the opportunity to <coughs> drive forward for the next two or three years. Uh, you know, as we really kind of build the profile of technology in, in the east of England, Suffolk County Council, Norfolk County Council, and the New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership for your generosity and support. Also to our patrons, many of whom are here this morning, BT, KCOM, Ipswich Borough Council, Suffolk Chamber of Commerce, Norfolk Chamber of Commerce. Uh, our corporate affinity partners with whom we're building a really compelling you know, membership offer for Tech East members. Uh, we cover a number of different uh, uh, kind of business service areas, all of which are kind of key for startups, scale ups, and mature tech businesses. Ashton's Legal, Grant Thornton, IF Recruitment, <coughs> AT and AIP. Insurance workers, opportunities workshop, and lastly, AF Affinity, our media partner, partner Archant, and all the Tech East members who are here present today. I've seen In Style, Digital Tomorrow, Today, Free Rain. There are probably others I haven't seen so far, just to thank all of those guys. I mean, you coming on board early and helping us kind of build this network is absolutely key. And talking of networks, I think I should say thank you particularly to somebody who has really driven the tech and digital networking in Ipswich over the last few years. And I think without whom, a lot of the energy that we're sort of feeling in the room today wouldn't uh, be felt, and that's Sam Barnell. Thank you, Sam, for coming. Uh, Sync Ipswich. Sims have been key bodies in helping get this movement going. <coughs> Last but not least, the Tech East Board for the leadership and ongoing support that you're providing in putting the East of England on the map uh, regionally, nationally and globally as we are beginning to do. So that's the thank yous. It feels like a kind of best man speech. <laughs> So a couple of, uh, over here. Couple of uh, things to, to just to kind of highlight about, you know, why is Tech East here? What are we here to do? I mean, the vision is ambitious um, and we think eminently achievable with the right uh, engagement, support and dynamism from groups like this. 
cluster, which is to be a top five UK tech cluster by 2020. And that would mean adding 650 million in, at least in GBA and 5,000 jobs to our current market. And really, uh, tech is a global, national, regional phenomenon. It's probably you know, the fastest growing industry worldwide. You just look at the world's most valuable companies now, Apple, Google, Amazon, and so on. Um, it's a big deal, right? And we have a role to play. Uh, but there's much work to be done if we are to build that profile and build that status as a leading cluster. And how are we doing this? Well, it's events like today. It's getting everybody together, galvanizing, getting a, a kind of clear message about what the opportunity is, what the challenges are, and what we're going to do about it. And we're doing that by linking up businesses, educators, public sector, government, media, and uh, consumers, I mean, uh, and, and not just consumers of tech products, but consumers of tech education, young people. This is really all about, if we're honest, talent and skills and developing that. And it requires a joined up approach. If we're to engage millennials and the next generation of potential tech uh, leaders and employees, We've all got to work together. And skills is really, I guess, uh, the number one priority for any business and for us at Tech East. How do we create such a compelling pool of talent in our schools, our colleges, universities, and businesses that why would you want to be based anywhere else uh, if, you, if you want to build a great tech business? And we already have great talent. And there's a lot of work to be done. So what I'm just going to run through now is a kind of sneak preview of the work that we've been doing, working very closely with New Anglia, Anglia LEP uh, on the digital skills plan. That's, this, this is a bit of a piece of work that's been ongoing for some months, and I know a lot of you have been involved in consultation and feeding into that plan. Still very much work in progress. We, we, we're getting very quick, close to having the first release which will effectively be a green paper, providing a kind of high-level roadmap for how this might go forward. But there's a lot of work to do to put flesh on the bones. What the plan has told us, and what the findings from the plan have told us, is interesting and important. And I'm just going to run through that briefly. So first, this is a big deal. Right? We're a high-performing, large tech cluster in the East of England. And by East of England, I would include kind of primarily Norfolk and Suffolk, but also like kind of Essex and Cambridgeshire are kind of key in this, as I was going to say. But employing 17,000 people, 1.3 <coughs> billion value. This is, uh, you know, this is this is this is a very significant uh, thing that we've got our hands on here. But it's not, I think, uh, just about the tech businesses. It's not just about tech product and service businesses. It's about how technology is now underpinning pretty much every priority sector for growth, whether that's advanced manufacturing and engineering, life sciences, agri-tech, construction, ports and logistics, but this goes on. Uh, tech UK, who I was with last week, London Tech Week, would describe actually the tech sector is shrinking because it's not really just a sector anymore. It's, it's, it's underpinning the, the whole of enterprise and business. And if you've read the industrial strategy, green paper, you'll see just how important a plank pillar that is for the UK economy. We have uh, a kind of interesting opportunity and a challenge. So the Tech Nation report now recognizes both Greater Ipswich and Norwich as significant tech clusters within the UK. Different, uh, different kind of cultures, different flavors of technology, different types of businesses present, but both really significant. But we're really close to two of the world's leading tech clusters. London, number three tech cluster in the world, after Silicon Valley in New York City. Cambridge, probably up there in the world's leading innovation and R&D tech phenomena and the birthplace of companies that have gone on to be global unicorns like Autonomy, HP Autonomy, 
and most recently ARM, uh, sold to SoftBank, you know, these are global players, and the talent that's being recycled through those businesses and out of those businesses is continuing to drive the Cambridge tech phenomenon. But Cambridge, as those of you here who are from Cambridge will know, and those of us who visit it on a regular basis, it's a compact, dense place that has some challenges around land and space, and there's a great opportunity for us here in Suffolk to provide, to take some of the pressure out of that system by providing an infrastructure and a tech environment for businesses to grow on from Cambridge and to build better links with Cambridge. But London, of course, is just down the road. We're an hour away from Ipswich Station. That's why we opened the Tech East London Embassy in order to build a much better connection with the London market, capital markets, uh, with uh, uh, decision makers, and with tech businesses there, but also to provide our members with touchdown space and the opportunity to work and represent their businesses in London. The, the numbers here are quite, kind of quite exciting, but they're also quite challenging. Our analysis would show that by 2024, there are gonna be 10,000 tech jobs cycling through this economy. That's new roles, based on growth in the sector, that's uh, replacement uh, for existing roles. Uh, for the uh, recruitment consultants and HR professionals in the room, that means there's a lot of work and a lot of opportunity coming. But that also means there's a huge pool of skills, talent that we need to build. As I say, the uh, tech skills plan is work in progress, close to completion. Uh, we've worked very closely with New Anglia Let in order to make sure that employers' voices have been heard in this. Uh, and we've also tried to ensure that both the kind of qualitative employer feedback, but also the quantitative data that already exists, has been used to build something robust and build something credible that we can all get our teeth into. What are employers saying? Well, any of you who read yesterday's EADT Business Monthly Supplement on Digital Skills, and thank you to Archon for putting that together and to Suffolk County Council uh, for uh, ensuring there is that kind of platform out there. I mean, the, I probably don't need to, I probably don't need to read out the list. There's a long list of core skills that are now required, uh, required by businesses, whether it's core programming, coding skills in the, more, the most contemporary development frameworks and languages. The cloud is, has changed the way that tech businesses work operationally and how consumers access these products. <coughs> the skill sets around AWS and Azure in cloud transitioning are uh, increasingly in demand. User experience, you know, 10 years ago no one had ever heard of user experience or customer experience, but UX design and the way that products actually feel and work is incredibly important. If you look at a, a business like Airbnb, Uber in the news today, uh, they have built products and platforms based around that user experience. And then the whole business about how you turn that, how you, how you turn these ideas into products that work for customers and work operationally. Product managers who can interface with a technical team, with a sales team the marketing team and be the voice of the customer. These are the kinds of skills that we need to build. And if we can't create the, those, that talent here, we're going to have to continue to import it from out, outside. Businesses are telling us that graduates coming fresh out of university may not have the business and communication, and collaboration and teamworking skills required to be effective. And that's an opportunity as well as uh, uh, an issue. It's a global market. I mean, the, t the talent issues here are not uh, limited to New Anglia and global players like Microsoft, Cisco, Amazon Web Services dominate really the certification and the importance of those is really, is, is really key and we have to be mindful of that. We can't just create a local offer. It has to be connected to the global one. But we're definitely hearing from employers that there's an appetite for collaboration more closely schools, through outreach and engagement, with colleges, with apprenticeships, 
and with uh, higher ed. So the door is open, and this is great to see both, as it were, both sides of that, of that debate here today. <coughs> I think there are some kind of myths that need to be busted, or there are some assumptions that need to be challenged. A lot of employers have a kind of default expectation or assumption that a graduate with two years experience and more is the, is the kind of sweet spot in terms of developer, uh, programmer, product manager. That may be true, but, it, but it's putting pressure on the market if we're just looking at those types of skills and it's putting pressure on, um, it's putting up pressure on, uh, on salaries, it's creating a hot market, an overheated market. There are other ways, and we've got to explore all of those. Apprenticeships, we'll hear more about uh, very shortly from Zerifka. But apprenticeship uh, enrollments, <coughs> digital tech apprenticeship uh, enrollments have flatlined. Uh, and it's only now with the introduction of the apprenticeship levy, we think there's a kind of catalyst for change there. But I think there's more work to be done. And if anyone read my recent LinkedIn post on do UK tech apprenticeships have an image problem, I think you probably agree that for the tech sector, the term apprentice doesn't necessarily resonate with what the expectations for some high growth, high performing industry are. And lastly, there was some uh, alarming news this week from the BCS um, around GCSE enrolments on GCSE computing science, which has replaced ICT within schools. Again, it's flat, it's not growing. Why is that? If we can't get mo momentum at secondary, and at the primary school level. This ain't ever going to happen. We're going to be continuing to go in the same loop of buying in talent, and that's not the answer. Uh, last week, uh, here in Suffolk, at the Dustwell Park, Gavin Patterson from BT made the point that we've got to catch people much, much earlier. STEM is key. Uh, engaging women in tech is absolutely essential. We have a pretty dreadful diversity and gender imbalance within the profession, within the industry, uh, but we've got a chance. But that's got to be embedding that mindset and those skill sets from a much younger age. So, the plan is moving forward. Uh, we've absorbed uh, views from across the industry, skills reach, uh, who have been the development partner for the left in terms of driving this for themselves. Um, have uh, gathered a lot of data, and it's coming up with three key <coughs> kind of recommendation areas for the framework. Number one, <coughs> unless uh, skills development agenda is informed by, led by employers and businesses, it, it's going to be a it's going to be a mismatch. So we believe that the only way to ensure this happens, is to create a group, a task force, a board, to really represent both employers and the education sector and other stakeholders and drive this forward. And uh, we will be shortly announcing the uh, kind of inaugural uh, task force membership. We are interested in hearing from more employers who would like to be involved in that. There will be regular meetings, probably monthly with, so there will be a certain time commitment, but it's really important that we do this, because unless those voices are heard and continually reflected back uh, and around the education providers, uh, we think that there is a um, that there is there is a danger that this could become kind of something that goes in a drawer and never gets read. But the University of Suffolk has been fantastically supportive, both uh, Mo Hammonds, uh, Richard, and the rest of the team. Amy, Caroline have been fantastic in, in, kind of, in kind of stepping up to the plate. So it's a huge op op opportunity for the University of Suffolk and also for our other uh, universities, University of East Anglia, our patron, uh, but also uh, Norwich University of Arts, which has uh, some fantastic resources in this area too. We've got to look at different pipelines of talent, and that's not just about apprenticeships but it's an important part of it. If we're just going to rely on you know, degree in computer science, 
tedious experience. We're not going to get the numbers. I mean, 10,000 by 2024 is a big number, given that the net output of computer science graduates across the whole of the east of England, including the universities of Cambridge, East Anglia, Anglia Ruskin, uh, Essex, and, and, and the ones within North and Suffolk, is about 1,000. And those people aren't all going to work in businesses around here. You think about the University of Cambridge and the typical trajectory, career trajectory of graduates from there. It's London, it's international, it's all over the world. There are opportunities there. The apprenticeship levy is one, but there are some great programs starting off. Amazon Web Services have a program which we call Restart, which KCON is involved in, which is about training up uh, young people and uh, ex Armed services personnel uh, that is providing internships, that's providing uh, British apprenticeships. Uh, we're working with Amazon Web Services to bring more of that to this part of the world. Now, lastly, and I think this is absolutely essential, and the skills, uh, the Tech Skills Institute or the uh, Technology Institute, form a, a real uh, uh, valuable part of this. Is taking those people who are mid-career and upskilling them and investing in our people and ensuring that people who have the ability to become kind of key knowledge workers in the tech economy are invested in once they get into businesses. And I know there are some fantastic examples around the room of how that's already happening. But continuing professional development, the topping up of knowledge, access to free courses, access to paid courses, and exploiting that across the whole region is the opportunity that we've got. And I think we'll hear in a moment just how much the University of Suffolk have, have, have kind of got in their, in their bag as a response to this. So, my last slide. So the process has begun. Uh, this is really about cascading some of the key messages from the digital skills plan. Um, <coughs> That task force I mentioned will be really putting flesh on the bones of the plan. And we want this to be an ongoing consultative approach. And the tools to make that really easy are things like Twitter, are things like LinkedIn. It is social media, it's about having that conversation online as well as picking up the phone, as well as coming to board meetings, as well as putting your hand up to volunteer for opportunities. So please make this a digital conversation as well that our world can see and show that you know within the east of England we are leading, we're absolutely leading on this agenda. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Mohammed Abdel Khadid, who is head of uh, computing science or science and tech, science and tech at the University of Suffolk. Thank you, Thank you very much. As Tim kind of alluded, the problem of the digital skills shortage and skill shortage in general is not unique to Suffolk, it's not unique to the UK, actually it's a global issue. Yeah. Or did, I, did I do something wrong? <laughs> okay. So if we look at what our colleagues in the States are saying, well, this, this is pretty much the same. So I look a little bit further and says the university actually cannot solve the skills gap, they actually created it, so forget about universities altogether. <laughs> and if we move back to the EU, to find analysts coming and saying, no, 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 universities have nothing to do with the skills gap. It's actually the business's problem. You do not offer sufficient packages, attractive working environment, so you're losing your competitive edge in attracting top talents to your industry. That's your problem. It's not the university's problem. So it's not really an agreed, it's a controversial global issue. And the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And what we try to do is try and understand the root causes. Why do we have globally universities full of professors, PhD qualified, award-winning academics and researchers that actually contribute massively to the development of the new knowledge, and still we have a, a gap in, in the product. And that's what we're trying to do. What are the root causes of this? What's preventing these universities from producing the goods? So we started by looking at the curriculum. 
who is who? Who designs the curriculum? Who dictates what students actually study? And it begins with Quality Assurance Agency in the UK. This is the government body that sits the base. Those are the guys who come and decide what are the key learning outcomes that anybody in the educational ladder should have. So for us as a university, starting at level three, which is the BTEC and the National uh, Foundation and the A-levels, that's level three, then moving up the ladder to level six, that's your BSc graduate, then level seven, and level eight, and that's your PhD graduates. And they decide what are the core competencies and key learning outcomes that need to be there. Now, the Quality Assurance Agency does not offer a framework for subject specific. It's more general. Then we have the professional accreditation bodies, such as the BCS, the IAT, the IEEE, and recently the tech partnerships. And those are employer representatives that actually offer what are the key core competencies in a subject specific manner. And then we have the employer body that feeds into the professional accreditation bodies, but also feeds into the academic community. The academic community are split into two parts. One part is the team that develops what the curriculum in a particular institution, and then it's the peers in the UK and globally. And at the end of the day, the QA framework, the professional accreditation bodies, gets interpreted by the academic community based on their understanding, their convictions, what they believe is right, what they believe is not right, and then translate this into a curriculum. So we can see that employers' wider representation is not really embedded here. So the first thing that we tried to do at the University of Suffolk is to break this loop and put the employers right in the middle. Not just the employers, but students as well. So responding to your first point, when we talked about employers and being them, well, employers in our framework now are partners in the design of the curriculum, in the delivery of the curriculum, and in the maintenance of the curriculum. So it's no longer that we have recommendations on the outside. No, they are core partners in the delivery. Now, we believe this is going to help. Do you think that's going to help? Hopefully. Is it going to solve the entire problem? Not quite. Because there is still more. The curriculum is, can be split into key categories of skills. And we have enduring skills. Traditionally, enduring skills, these are the core academic skills. The theories, the design, all the things that the academics actually consider valuable. So that's the core things. And historically, that was the main bulk of the meat. Then, over a decade ago, the importance of the transferable skills <coughs> in terms of communication, time management, professionalism, business skills, etc., started to become more and more important. So now, they are becoming part of what we do. So that's not something new. That's something that we've been doing for over the past decade. And it's usually labeled under employability skills. Then the third one is transient skills. And that's typically your development tool, platforms, software. So when you mention PHP, Ruby and Rails, Windows Azure, etc., etc., all this falls under the transient skills. And typically, all these frameworks that I've spoken about do not really place a lot of value on transient skills. Actually, traditionally, transient skills, oh, you want to learn how to code in C++? Well, that's something that you pick up in the weekend. That's not something that we focus on in, in the university. Yes, we're going to give you data structures and coding techniques, and we'll give you an assignment where you can pick up C++ or whatever development. But that is not what our learning outcomes actually have. That is what academic community believe. That is what the QA and many of the professional accreditation bodies actually believe. Such that, so when you come and say, employers come and say, yeah, we need PHP, we need this, we need all these software tools. Well, the academic community says, yeah, 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 well, they'll pick it up. It's, it's not a big deal, they'll, they'll pick it up. And what happened is that the landscape of industry have moved on from the time when this model was the optimal model. 
the time where the tech businesses were R&D heavy, populated by people who, with PhDs coming out of universities, and actually a lot of the businesses were spin-outs of universities. So those guys actually trends and skills to them, they pick up on weekend. That's not a big deal for them. And also the workforce were predominantly the geeks like myself, who have no problem whatsoever spending the evenings and weekends and sacrificing the work balance, sort of uh, work-life balance, in order to get the satisfaction of learning something new. Now we have a landscape that is based on applications and services, and a workforce that is mainstream workforce that want to have a good work-life balance, want to have lucrative paying careers. So they're not the, the same people. Another thing happened is that the nature of the development tool and the trends and skills stopped becoming that transient and easy to pick up on the weekend. Actually, they became that much complex that they require a lot more investment in actually training people. So that is, we see, so what we try to do is shift the mindset of the academic community. In my personal view, that is the biggest thing that we've done here at the university. It was myself, my team, and colleagues, the mind should have shifted from that old model into the mindset that transient skills, enduring skills, are going to be embedded together. And they're going to be embedded in such a way that students will graduate with the top-notch skills in, the, in today's transient skills that you need, but at the same time, they have the ability to move on. Because we know that in two, three years' time, you're going to be asking to do something that we have no clue what it is. So they have to be prepared to do this. And that is, in my view, the biggest shift that we have done. And of course, the focus on the transferable skills and the business acumen is paramount. So putting all this together, what we try to do is come up with a package of offering. So there is the standard three-year offering. We're looking uh, at ways of accelerating two years delivery. Then we're into the uh, apprenticeship model. And then we have embedded professional certi certification into our awards. Now, professional certification, we're not just embedding them because they offer good value for the student employability. Professional certifications are predominantly set up by employers. And they predominantly focus on today's and tomorrow's trends and skills. And they continuously update. So by embedding the professional certifications within our core delivery, we hope to be always upbeat with what is the latest in transient skills, in addition to the feedback that we get from our uh, employers. And of course, short courses and lifelong learning routes. So if we go to the apprenticeship, we have got our accreditation on the BSc in Digital Technology Solutions. What they uh, offer in the Tech Partnership Framework is these specialisms. We've got the first four at the moment. And typically, this is a BSc with one single specialization, and you have to choose if you want a cyber analyst, or if you want a network engineer or a software engineer. What we've done in developing our curriculum <coughs> for the apprenticeship is we realize that SMEs probably need multi-talented, multi-skills people who can deliver in a number of areas. So our <coughs> BSc in network engineering covers the entirety of the core, the entirety of the network engineer specialization. It goes beyond the descriptor of networking and goes into the software defined Networking, network function virtualization, <coughs> and, edge, uh, and uh, edge computing, as well as the latest 5G, but also it covers the entirety of the cybersecurity analyst specialism. So actually, our graduate is as good as a person with two full specializations network engineer and a cyber security analyst. Then we go to the software engineering. That covers the software engineering specialisms. 
that covered the entirety of the cybersecurity analyst and it covered the entirety of the data analyst specialist. So you get a person with three specializations. Now, is that all? No. We're trying to also tap into the MSC and you'll be hearing from us because we said we're going to develop it together. <coughs> so we'll be knocking on your doors to choose the specializations. But is that all we offer in, in the apprenticeship? No. We've integrated the certifications, so we've got the Cisco certification, but we've also integrated two industry standard se uh, secure, uh, security certifications. Now, our graduates have the opportunity to walk away, graduate, with at least two professional certifications under their belt. Now, what is the value of these certifications? That's the salary trend of a certified secure life cycle professional. And you can see your lowest end of salary is 45K within a year of graduation, and you move up as So this, in its own right, without all the other values, that offers a big value for our graduates, and hopefully will offer you with workforce that can contribute effectively. You just have to make sure that you keep them. Now, in addition to the apprenticeship framework, we offer our standard degrees. So we have mobile and web engineering, business management and IT, computer games programming, computer game design, and we're putting another one in cybersecurity. That is a bit different from the apprenticeship framework. That is more of the bleeding edge of cybersecurity specialists. So it goes even beyond the current tech partnership framework. And we have MSC computer games development that we're doing. While those guys don't have the opportunity to go with an employer in a formal apprenticeship sort of way, because these are standard ones, so among the things that we are keen on offering is knowledge transfer partnerships, KTPs. So your graduates from here can join your company on a KTP scheme that you do not actually employ them. We employ them for a period of two years and we actually offer an academic team that will help supervise whatever task that you want them to deliver and, want, and the government pays the majority of the costs, I think the government pays 60% uh, of the cost if they are SME and it's slightly less if it's a larger company. And at the end of the two years, you, can, you had the opportunity to check your, the student and if you wish to employ them, then you can. If you don't wish, then you can't. So that is another thing that we're trying to do. We w we're also focusing on the blended learning lifelong learning approach on the short courses and I believe Mohammed alluded already and mentioned to you the umbrella that we are keen on offering this through and that's one of the key things that we are expanding on because we realize the importance of it. Now we wouldn't be addressing all the needs if we did not start from the primary school all the way up. So we already have STEM engagement programs at schools, we're working with PT, we're working with everybody who's keen to work with us to embed or to attract and help develop the talent pool at schools. We offer, for example, research and development internships that any 14 years old and above can come join my department as a research and development intern, work for a week or two weeks on a specific project. We have STEM tasters where we get school children and give them tasters of what and, and many, many other sort of things. We understand that at the end of the day, you do not employ a piece of paper with a qualification and list of skills on it. You employ a wholesome person with skills, knowledge, ability, attitude, behavior, traits. And that is what we're trying to do with the students throughout the journey. Help build that wholesome person that can contribute. But we cannot do this alone. We have to do it together, right from the inception, the derivative, through the maintenance. And that's in a nutshell how we're trying to respond to the needs uh, as identified. 
that leaves me to invite my colleagues Daniel and Nicole from Derivical to tell us a little bit about their experience with the apprenticeship framework. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, my name is Daniel. I may have been part in introducing the apprenticeships into Derivical. The purpose of me standing in front of you today is that we have talked about a lot of ideas, a lot of progress that we've made. I want to try and encourage some action um, on our part and on your part to get involved and to really start building on some of the big ideas that we've already talked about. Essentially, I'm going to run you through, I'm going to speak to you for a couple of minutes, a little bit about who we are, why we have started to do these things, why I think you should, and if you choose to, how you should go about it, what, kind of, what are the immediate next steps that you can so as to Rivco, we are a software company, we're a local branch of a global company, we're based up in Crown House, we've got about 170 people sat in the office today creating some really cool software solutions. The threats and the opportunities that we face are very similar and mirrored among a lot of the other companies that I know are in the room today. So I'm confident that the things that I will tell you will resonate quite nicely with the, the business that you're doing. We started looking at this, um, specifically I'm going to focus on apprenticeships, and when I say apprenticeships I mean the level 6 Bachelor of Science degree apprenticeships. Um, and we're one of the companies that, as Mohammed talked about, about building those uh, transferable skills, the transient skills. We've come in, we've talked to the university, we've had a really great experience of starting to build and starting to bring a lot of depth into uh, the new apprenticeship degrees that they're offering so that they're really relevant, they're really valuable to us. The reason that we've done it, the reason that we sat down and said, okay, we will do some apprenticeships, why, um, is around a number of key challenges that we've, we have found ourselves facing. And these link nicely to some of the things that Tim said earlier. Um, in the East, we have got a bit of a skills gap and we're finding it increasingly challenging to get all of the right people who've got the right skills, maybe some of these oven-ready uh, candidates to come into the business ideally locally, but we're recruiting around the world. And we'd like to try and bring some of that a little bit closer to home. We want to bring it into the east. We want to try and invest in, in the local area, in building that skills cluster, um, and bring something back, a bit of corporate social responsibility into the community. The apprenticeships and the University of Suffolk are one of the ways that we're doing that. Beyond that, um, the opportunity to tailor, to, to build those transient skills, is something that's quite unique. So, uh, to go a step beyond the unready graduate, the, the person that's coming in with some skills and experience that might be ideal for one business, but not so much for us, the partnership here is letting us change that. So, when we finish our apprentices, when in three and a bit years they graduate, we will have a professional that's already got a huge amount of additional maturity compared to a vanilla candidate, if you like, rolling off of a BSc program. So that's kind of why we did it. I'll, I'll talk now about why I believe that you should do it, and, and you'll find every reason that I, I say you should, and that goes back into what we do. The first reason, and it's the, the absolute simplest, is taxation. Okay, you've got the apprenticeship levy coming in. I'm not going to give a whole speech on the levy. Uh, most of the details about that are known now. But in a nutshell, if you've got a larger pay bill, well, you're going to be relieved of some of your money. Why not reinvest it in something that's going to be valuable for you? If you're a particularly small company, if you're fewer than 50 employees, you're being handed a tremendous opportunity by the government to take advantage of that, help build a little bit in society at the same time as you build into your own business. Thinking even more broadly than just the, the apprenticeship levy side of things, in implementing apprenticeships at Derivco, we've looked very carefully at the numbers and, and tried to answer the question, when are these people going to be truly valuable to us in a bottom line sense? And we've worked out that towards the end of their second year with us, they're still really quite junior professionals, even with all of the cost of putting them through a training scheme, and I'm not, again, not just including the pure financial cost, but this time having people out of the office, having the release, and this is based on only the, the very early uh, day release system, not the great ideas that Mohammed has got coming up. Um, two and a half years, we're going to have people who are creating genuine earned value for the business. So when you're thinking about introducing this, think about how that applies to you. The numbers will be different, but I'm confident you will very quickly actually have somebody creating value for you whilst you're still putting value into them. Benefits, reasons why you should go and beyond the finances. This applies equally well to people that are already working in your business as people that you're bringing in afresh. 
We're trying to tending to bring people in fresh to us because we're growing. If you've already got people who sat in your room who you're thinking need upskilling, then a, a degree apprenticeship is a fantastic way to do that. And of course, you'll gain even more than that, even more than just the skills that they get from the apprenticeship. You will gain other things around the staff satisfaction, you'll gain around the retention, and you'll gain around the, the kind of longer tie in that em employer employee loyalty that you get through investing in them. So I think by spending that little bit now, you will continue to reap the benefits for quite some time to come. I've already mentioned a few times building those transient skills. Um, in Derivco, we are uh, very heavily reliant on Microsoft products. We build a lot of our technology stack based on that. And we're already starting to look at some of the cloud technologies that Mohammed has already focused on. Now, I know there are some other Microsoft Gold Partner companies who are sat in the audience today. So a kind of detailed message to you guys. We've already looked at the service, we've worked with these guys, we've sat down opposite Nicholas Caldwell on many occasions, and we've tried to bring in all of the elements that are important to us that our oven ready graduate really is oven ready for the things that we need them to come into our business and do today. Now I say today, that's one part of it. We're not gonna get these graduates today. We're gonna get them in three and a bit years time. And over that period of time, we, along with no doubt some of you, will continue coming into the university. We'll keep looking at that specification, we'll keep looking at the skills that the apprentices are getting, and we'll keep them relevant. And by doing that all together, that open rate graduate gets better and better every time. Finally, kind of everything I've said is aimed towards why you should do it if you're a core business technology company. If you're not, if you've got only a very immature or no IT function in your company at all, the degree apprenticeships are a great way to maybe try out an experiment in your business. If you're thinking about diversifying into doing some tech, if you're having internal challenges that you think technology might be the solution to, bringing in a new employee or upskilling an existing one using the apprenticeship framework, whether it's all the way to level six, whether it's partway, whether it's even beyond that, this is a really nice way to kind of safeguard your business from some of the risk, particularly financial risk, and get somebody who's going to be able to contribute something early on. That's as far as I'm going to go. That's why we have, that's why I believe you all should consider doing some apprenticeships. We're going to be around for some time afterwards, uh, so please do grab us if you want to know any more specifics, um, things about the apprenticeship levy, please talk to me. If you want to know things around how we've implemented it, things around the syllabus, then come and talk to the team. But Nicola, if you'll come up and join me, please. Nicola has joined us in Derivco as our internal recruiter. She's got a huge amount of experience in recruiting. We've been doing it for 10 years, been recruiting specifically for IT for the last seven, and all of that locally in the East. So Nicola has a huge amount of knowledge about the skills gaps that we face, the strengths, the weaknesses that we've got. And you're going to tell the room a little bit more now about what the concrete next steps are, how to get involved, and maybe a little more about why. Yeah, absolutely. So, hi, I'm Nicola. Um, I'm mindful of going over the same points again, but just to re-emphasize, you know, we recognise the IT space here locally is set to grow and continues to grow. There is a skills gap, um, and equally about working in partnership. As Danny said, we're really keen to do that. We're delighted with the partnership that we've had with the university, um, but we are really keen to partner with other local businesses as well. So at Derivco, I mean, we've certainly grown significantly in the last couple of years and continue to do so. So, you know, finding and sourcing talented individuals into the business continues to be a challenge for us. Um, we're very multicultural as an organisation, which is, is fantastic, but equally, you know, we're really keen to deal with the talent pool locally um, and invest back into the local community as well. So we see the apprenticeship scheme as a key, key way of doing this. So feeding that talent pipeline. And like we said, you know, the, the earlier we start that, the earlier we can get the engagement people, the more successful that pipeline becomes. Um, and we, we see huge benefits in the apprenticeship scheme um, and giving people the chance to really realise their potential, giving them the knowledge and tools to do that. Um, so, so yeah, the message is, you know, we're delighted to be working with the university. We're keen to partner with other local businesses. We're quite happy. You know, we've, we've done a lot of the groundwork, a lot of the hard work already, um, and we're quite happy to work with businesses, 
through the process, take you through every step of that, along with the support of the university as well from a, a process and application point of view. Um, so really just to mirror, come and have a chat with us. Uh, myself and Daniel are here, waiting for our colleagues at the end of the room, so Lucy and Sapphire um, just near the back there as well. Um, so we're really open to, to having a chat, kind of sharing what we've learned already and, and how we can work together. Thanks, We're about to go to a break, um, so we've got 15 minutes uh, break out, there's refreshments at the back of the room and then we'll reconvene here back in our seat. <coughs> Thank you. Right, it's your chance now. We talk about collaboration, well collaboration is two ways, so this is your chance to ask a few questions of this wonderful panel. I have a great job of just passing and directing those questions to the right person. We will do a very, very quick introduction, I think. I think we'll obviously thank you for the, the brief introduction then. I'm Neil Mars. I have the pleasure to be founder and uh, chair of Tech East. I'm also uh, possibly an entrepreneur. I've been developing tech companies um, in the region um, and uh, currently uh, CEO and founder of a new AI business called InnerSight. So why are we here? Why do we do that from my perspective? Well, it all started here for me, only a few feet away. I did my computer sciences at England. So I'm a local lad, educated here, and I think it's a fantastic region, and we do need to invest in what is a wonderful sector. So that's why I'm here, and that's why I think um, we're all working and collaborating together. So that's me. I'm Catherine Jones, CEO of Digital Tomorrow Today. We're a local company based just uh, outside Brighton, and we work with uh, Brighton and Sheffield and Sheffield and Sheffield and marketing tools which are available to anybody to use online, um, and which we sell to a global market. Jonathan Lee Smith from BT, based at uh, Adaptral Park, which uh, if you weren't aware is BT's global R&D headquarters with about 3,000 of our employees and as well as 1,000 uh, of the other innovation launching companies. My role is I'm head of uh, our strategic research program on longer term research activities, also our research partnerships, so I work with industry around the world, I work with universities around the world <coughs> as well. Not necessarily a good qualification for this. Uh, but I also run a, school, a local school engagement program, so uh, based around the Eastern Um BT uh, hires about twice as many apprentices as we do graduates, around 100 locally, I think. Um, and of course, unlike graduates, <coughs> apprentices are naturally from the local region, so we have a very direct interest in this. And of course, you saw the quote that Tim was up from, uh, from our CEO as well. Tim Robinson. I'm uh, Mark Johnson Kredris. Uh, we, we are a team of 20 people, primarily uh, business to business, kind of consulting, offering embedded in mobile software for kind of a lot of blue chip companies. We work with quite a lot of, uh, kind of high profile projects like the Americans Cup, providing mobile software for the platform. Also, Bowser and Wilkins kind of providing kind of you know, audio solutions, but it's all about not necessarily those, because we're not sailors and we're not audio specialists. But it's all about you know the tech and the and performance of that uh, through that. So from the educational kind of side, you know, we've been working with a lot of universities in the area, we've been offering uh, summer internships, hiring graduates uh, constantly for the last uh, kind of five years. You know, on average, hiring you know, two to four graduates yearly into our kind of system, and kind of very much kind of promoting that. And you know, we've had a lot of feedback from our graduates that you know we kind of how can I tell them or show them a new path, a way of software development? I'm Mohamed Ali, I'm a professor of smart systems and I head the science and technology department at the University of Suffolk. Okay, <laughs> lots of intros, but now it's your chance, so come on, we're going to have some questions. Any questions for any of the panel or even any of the speakers today? Any questions or. I mean, you can't be silent. <laughs> it's not, not fun. Any questions at all? Any, any comments? Yeah, uh, Brian Lund from uh, Anglia and Water. Um, is it, I've got a few questions actually, but I'll just focus on one for the time being. I'm really interested in your the idea of these transient skills. Um, one of the problems that we have is actually taking on graduates and they don't necessarily have the skills that we're looking for immediately and we have to invest significantly to get them up to speed. Um, so I was really interested in that side of it. But um, Anglia and Water is a big region uh, going from the Humber right down to the Thames. And whilst we're very interested in working with you guys to build that transient skill set for us, 
How do you feel about working with other universities and being more collaborative with like the Lincoln University? Because we recruit into Lincoln, recruit into Huntington and into Cambridge. Well, as a university, we are part of the university ecosystem and partnership is at the DNA of our business as usual. So by all means, we are very, very open to collaborate. Actually, the University of Suffolk started as a collaboration between two universities. So that's right in our fabric. So very, very happy to discuss these things and work collaboratively with other colleagues from other universities to ensure that the pipeline and the logistics are managed appropriately to respond to your requirements. Do you have anything from that sort of techies called? Yeah. Um, so I think that's a, this touches on a really good thing. It's kind of like, what is techies? Like, and what's the East? Um, I was thinking about this just yesterday. I mean, Lincoln uh, probably described itself as being part of the East Midlands or something, something like that. But, you know, to me, the geographic area that we call either the East of England or East Anglia is pretty, is pretty big. And, you know, includes Essex, so that, you know, also kind of includes London. Um, the real reason I think that Tech East was, was put together was, to, was, was in recognition that despite all the fantastic things that are already occurring in the region, um, somehow we weren't quite on the radar. And um, especially the development of the Northern Powerhouse and the Tech North uh, doing a fantastic job promoting <coughs> tech in you know, the northwest, the north of England, kind of all the major cities. Um, you know, perhaps there was a danger that things would get, get, get a bit lost. So, I mean, for me, it's about, well, you know, everybody's welcome who wants to be part of something called Tech East, part of the East. And I think the other thing is, it, it is it's not just the UK. I mean, we're really now building partnerships with um, tech clusters, lots of like-minded tech clusters, similar tech clusters all around the world, including Waterloo, Ontario, which is the biggest in Canada, um, Singapore, so, you know, absolutely we should be doing that. And I think as an employer and as a sort of major player in the, in, in the market and a tech leader, Anglia and Water can sort of help us shape that network a bit further. I would like to do that further. Great. I want to follow up with uh, some of the contacts today. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah, one thing I just kind of noticed when we were in Ireland is, you know, don't just look at universities. Well, that's obviously the important part today. But it's getting involved in the community. You know, we've been running developer events, you know, doing demos, trying to inspire the next generation, you know, getting involved in sport, uh, sport and things like developer and those sort of things. So it's this isn't just kind of a once, you know, prong attack. You need to kind of put yourself out there and con you know, contribute to the community to build that from there. Because, you know, we found people, you know, through the events, you know, over the years, you know, doing it. So it is kind of, you know, do that as well. I think we are putting together, I think Tim mentioned at the beginning, a sub plan as part of Tech East, particularly to engage with universities and drive the skills plan forward for, for the lab. So maybe something to get involved in as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm right at the back. So, uh, leading up from that question, what are, what are the plans for bringing in somewhere like Suffolk New College? Because I just sometimes think that obviously there's kids who would go into this industry from A levels. But you'll, you, I think you will catch some kids over there. So I know Tim's been speaking to the guys from um, SNC, but what, what are the plans to wrap them into this process as well? So, um, is Viv here? No, she, she's had to go. Okay, well, hi, Richard is. Um, so, um, I'm pleased to say, I mean, this probably won't be giving any, away any, any, any secrets, uh, that Viv Gillespie, um, who's principal at Suffolk New College, will be um, uh, a core member of the uh, skills board, skills group, Task Force, we haven't quite come up with a name for it. Um, uh, I'm also pleased to say that Nicholas Savas from West Suffolk College uh, will be joining that group. Um, respectively, Viv taking a particular focus on the uh, FE colleges and the roles that they can play as FE colleges, and Nikos leading on how FE colleges are engaging with schools. So you're absolutely right, um, and you know it's great to see. I think several people from. Um, Suffolk New here today. Clearly, the, the two institutions are what's the word, co terminus. You know, it's one campus. It's one campus and two, uh, two arms. And, 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 you know, this to me, what today is underlying is that this actually is the physical centre of, of tech in Ipswich. Now we've got to embrace that. Thank you. More questions? We're on a roll. A couple of hands went up for sure. 
about as much as you want, even if people are busy. So we would like to make sure that that group has got uh, SME representation in their house. Fantastic. I am going to wrap because I'm conscious of time. Everyone's um, hands jumping up. Any final comments from, from the panel? Yeah. I just want to kind of reiterate uh, that from the university point of view, we do not think that we have the magic bullets and the only voice of wisdom who will find all the solutions, but we believe that collectively we can do this, and in doing so, we have absolutely no sense of competition. So if you are an SME, a company, if you offer your training, we will work with you, we will support you to deliver this, because that is part of our commitment to get the solution right. So by all means, please do not shy away from knocking on our doors and see what we can do together to address the problem. Yeah, you know, just kind of, you know, call out to all the companies is, you know, getting involved, you know, very much so from kind of all different aspects. I think one thing that I'm coming up with from is kind of, you know, think different. You know, don't say that, you know, it's not that way or you need to do something. You know, just get involved. Come in, complain. These guys you know I've kind of come down to my children. and both of them kind of say, can we do this? Can we do that? And stuff like that. And just get actively involved as much or as little as you want. So I don't know if Matthew Apple came this year ago, but he's got the creative <laughs> computing club. You know, that's kind of a great thing, getting involved with that and stuff like that. So just kind of just get involved. Thank you. Jim, you've had a bit of time, anything you want to add? I just want to say, um, what I think what Mo said earlier about transient skills is really, really important. I think we should all go away and think about this. It, because transient, it, it's about pace at which the sector is moving and about how you link uh, your education, your ongoing education to your job and the business <coughs> environment. And I think that for me is the big takeaway from today. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, so I've touched on the identity <coughs> of the region and the sound is an important point. I mean, this goes for external business, businesses outside the region as well as individuals. One thing I'd say is we, we can work on this, but we shouldn't get fixated on things like Ipswich, we need to call that Ipswich. Nobody knows where Ipswich is. Nobody knows where Cambridge is. They know all Cambridge. But outside it, they don't know. They could have put their finger on it, but they know about the brand and many things about it. So we need to bear in mind this is a collaborative venture. You know. We're too small here. Suffolk, arguably too small. There, there is a point at which you get too big. I don't quite know where it is. But we do have to collaborate. The universities have to collaborate with the region. The initiatives we put on the ground, because this is a scale problem, hundreds of thousands of kids, <coughs> hundreds of schools, we can all do our bit. Mark's right, we, we have to get involved, but we have to coordinate it, because otherwise yeah. it's not around events. Right, so, so, so collaboration on the ground, bearing in mind the, ident the identity we put forward, cannot be one physical geographic location. It has to be a sense of the region, and that can be done. We've got huge assets. Yeah. We've talked a lot about training the companies today, being a great conversation. I'd, I'd like to start a conversation, probably not now because of time, but um, about how we help people who are older who want to be trained to become developers get involved because it's much more motivating for somebody who's never trained to do it, maybe in their 30s, 40s, 50s, maybe older, who wants to start learning how to do that, um, to come to the university, to come to a company and say, can I be a trainee? What can we do that's different in this region to encourage those people to come forward and to support them? Thank you. I, I'm just going to say one quick thing, something Richard said at uh, dinner I was at the other night, I just want to remind us all about what the University of Suffolk, what a great asset we have. And remember this, and I, I think Richard was talking about the differentiation and why we have a University of Suffolk. One of the key points he made is that it's, it's our university, I think your university. So remember that. Please connect with the university to support the university, because I think it is a part of that, that collaboration on the ground together. So thank you to the panel. Um, thank you, panel, for your time. Thank you very much. We're all doing this properly. We're all following our instructions to the letter. Can I introduce you to Celia, the chair of the uh, Foundation? Yes, so um, who am I? Well, I can't follow Jenny. I'm not a geek. I don't even really understand um, any of the words, but I can be inspired by being amongst you all and by hearing uh, the other speakers who've been talking about the importance of um, 
tech in, in our world. Um, I am chairman of the foundation board for the university, which, as you all know, only became independent last year. So it's our first um, toe in the uh, waters of philanthropic raising. But the foundation board is not just that. Yes, we are here to raise money. But we're also here to raise friends, and I hope we've raised some today, um, to raise awareness of what the university does. And on that point, I would like to say something else that Richard very often um, says, and that is that this university not only prides itself, but measures itself by the impact it can make on the communities around us. That's not just Ipswich, it's not just Suffolk, it's our region. And there are many communities that need uh, a lot of help to improve their aspirations and their achievements. And that is central to this university, and that's different from other universities. Um, when we started the Foundation Board, we also started the Founding Supporters campaign, which has been running in a fairly soft way for the last year. We made a very small disbursement last um, autumn, we only had £18,000. We had projects put forward to us by departments, staff, students that we could have funded up to the value of about £100,000. The, 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 the difference, what we couldn't fund was immense and made it a very difficult thing. I hope that we'll have more than twice as much to disperse this year. But in addition, the, pro the projects that, that are put forward, we would like to be able to um, identify direct funders. So not coming from the pot that we've raised, but recognizing that they would resonate with different and individual um, businesses like all of you, and put to you the idea of that direct sponsorship. So that's coming along the line and we may be in touch with you if something really resonates with one or another of your businesses. Um, however, it is up till the 31st of July is your last wonderful opportunity to become founding supporters. There will never again be new founding supporters because it finishes then. You would be, your business or you as individuals would then be on a, a long-lasting plaque which will go up in the waterfront um, building. Um, after that, the Foundation Board is going to continue, obviously, to do all the things that I've talked about, but we are planning to have some special areas of interest and to encourage projects in those special areas of interest. And the f first and foremost, from your point of view, is um, projects that are aimed at removing hurdles and enabling progress with technology. But as well as that, there are many others that technology are going to help and underpin. And the other, uh, so I will tell you the other areas of special interest, social mobility and raising aspirations, encouraging and supporting underrepresented groups. And there have been several mentions today about uh, women in that category, and that is something that we will be looking at in particular. Helping suffer become more dementia aware. I'm sure you're all aware that um, we are an aging population. In The demography of Suffolk is an aging one, and the dementia issue is huge. And there are many ways that technology can help in our awareness and improvement of that particular problem for us. Um, encouraging uh, and supporting sustainability. Uh, Mohamed Daspers uh, mentioned sustainability as a very important area for all of us, and that's another special interest for the, for the Foundation Board. And then what I've already referred to, the student and staff initiated projects, which cover a huge range and encourage all of our university community to think outside the box, to put forward ideas that are really going to make an impact but cannot be funded from poor um, funding. So we'd like you to help us to transform the economy of our region, to transform the lives of those around us by raising their aspirations, 
and to increase the number and quality of work-ready future employees. We'd like you to demonstrate your belief in all that we're doing and the role that we can play in helping uh, this region by collaborating. And one of the ways you can help us do that is to ensure that we teach the right skills, both from your point of view, the employers, and for future employees. And much has been made of that already today. We'd like to encourage you to help us by spreading the word of what we do, what we do with you. We'd like you to give opportunities to our students, whether it's internships, or mentoring, or apprenticeships. Get involved with our students, and they will, you will benefit from their increased skills. And because it's my job, I also have to say, by donating to us. Um, I'd now just like to thank all of all of the people who've organized and contributed to this event, but I have to make special mention of Tim Robinson, Catherine Riddell, who is on my foundation board, and through whose offices this uh, conference has happened here. And I hope you will agree that this is a space which is neutral and that can bring many, many people and many different stakeholders together, benefiting and in the end producing uh, results that we can't do unless we all collaborate. So thank you in particular to them, also to Amy Carpenter and Ruth Patton who've done a lot of the organizing for today's um, event. You'll all receive a follow-up email. I may say this is the list that Amy has told me I cannot go without saying, so I'm saying it. Um, you'll all receive a follow-up email, but in the meantime, do feel free when we're having lunch to question any of us, any of the panel, anybody involved. Um, and if you'd like to know more about the IWIC in particular, speak to uh, Paul Thomas, who is here, or if you'd like a tour of the facilities and a, and a more in-detail uh, discussion about what the IWIC can, can do for us all, then Paul is your man. And finally, please enjoy your lunch. It's in the back in what is called the Ideas Room, which is a wonderful space that removes all formality from discussions. And bear it in mind as a venue for future events that you, your businesses, might like to use. It really does encourage innovative thinking. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy your lunch.